So again, I just say it again, we're in this series, God Culture. The title of this morning's message is The Flavor of Culture. Come on, say that with me, The Flavor of Culture. Matthew chapter 5 this morning, if you don't mind standing with me as we read and honor God's Word, Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 through 16 is what we will read this morning. Now many of you are familiar with this particular passage as we talk about the salt, as we talk about the light. And so I hope this morning that as I begin to expound upon the scriptures, then we can shed a little light on the practical part of what Jesus is teaching us. Amen? So Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 through 16. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Then he says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would use me as a conduit this morning to communicate your truth. God, to expound upon and shed light upon the scriptures and how it applies to our everyday living. God, may you open the ears of those that are listening this morning. And may they hear your voice as it goes beyond mine this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you in here are ice cream lovers? Anybody in here like ice cream? Good, good. I I love ice cream. And you know, if you love ice cream, you know there's all kinds of ice cream out there. Right? There's gelato, there's frozen custard, there's frozen yogurt, (laughs) there's soft serve, there's there's homemade, there's nitrogen-infused ice cream, there's rolled ice cream, there's ice cream galore. And I'm not even touching the surface of all the different ice creams, let alone the fact that there's over a thousand different flavors of ice cream. Every time that we travel, Chantel and I love to visit ice cream places too much. I'm telling you, too much, too much, too much. But while we're here in Shreveport, we like to journey down to the boardwalk area and visit a little place called, what, Cold Stone. How many of you have been to Cold Stone down there? Right? Generally, when we go to Cold Stone, we generally skip the meal because Cold Stone is as expensive as a meal. So we just decide we're going to have one or the other. But we love to go down there because they have all kinds of flavors and mixtures and things that you can put in there. And you know that I love peanut butter, right? I love peanut butter everything, it seems like. And so I generally try to put some concoction together of peanut butter something or other. And then we'll get our ice cream, and then we sit down at the, the little tables they have there. And then I just begin to judge everybody that's walking by. I'm really not talking much because I'm a people watcher, so I'm judging everybody and thinking, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not kidding. But I just like to watch everybody, not really judging in the sense of I'm just like, I wonder about this person. I wonder about this person. I wonder where they go to church, or I wonder if they go to church. and Whatever it may be, I think about the shirt that they have on or the way they've done their hair. I look at shoes and all of that, all while I'm eating my ice cream. And now i got to tell you this. Chantal and I eat ice cream completely different. Now, I know, and don't be judging me, but I take bites of ice cream. I don't waste no time. I get right into it, and I don't mess around. I eat it, and generally I'm done 10, maybe 15 minutes before she's done. I mean, I I just, I get in and and get to work on the ice cream. She savors every lick, or I don't even think she could call it bite because she really doesn't do it that way. Every spoonful, let's put it that way. But so we're different that way. But there was one time that I ordered my peanut butter, whatever it was, and man, they put a lot of peanut butter in it. A lot of peanut butter in it. And I love peanut butter, so you can put a lot of peanut butter in whatever it is. But this time, there was so much peanut butter in it, I couldn't finish it. I I, I ate a few, I kept complaining about it every bite, and Chantal was like, you know, just go back and tell them. I'm like, no, I don't want to go back and be the complainer and do all this. And so eventually, you know what, I just went and threw it away. It was too much. You know, and as I, I, I think about how something that I could love so much could be something that I'd be willing to go throw away. And when it comes to certain things that we like, too little or too much can make something that's just right not good. 
Maybe you remember that when Chantal and I first started dating and we started uh, getting to know each other, you know, she's Hispanic and I'm not. And when she would come back to where I lived in Indiana, one of the first things that she made a comment about was the flavor of the food. Now, in her culture, they use a lot of seasoning on their food. And in my culture, I guess that we don't use as much seasoning. I never knew. I just liked the way that mom made food. But Chantel, because according to her culture, they use a lot more seasoning. And her words to me, you know, your, your, your guys' Thanksgiving food is very bland. And it wasn't that she was saying that ours was bad, but just from what she was used to, it didn't have the flavor, the seasoning that she was used to. And so I want to... Uh, post to pick some pictures up here and I want us to see something as we get into our text because I want us to think in too little too much the right amount so in this particular picture that we've got up on the screen light affects a picture right this is what we would call underexposure it doesn't have enough light in the picture so the picture appears darker than it should be and then we have this picture and this is overexposure. There's too much light. And too much light begins to bleach out the colors. And it loses the vibrancy. It loses the feel of it. The same way that, that the underexposure, not enough light, begins to take away from the picture. The same way too much can take away. But when you have the right amount of light, you have the right or the correct exposure. It looks beautiful. I want to be there. Wow. Everything just seems to be so vibrant and it draws you in, right? And so it's the same way when we begin to look at our text, too much salt in your food, it triggers what? A facial reaction. You know, it's like your, your jaws begin to tighten up and it, and it takes away from the savoriness, is that a word, savoriness, of the food. But you get what I'm saying. It takes away from what should be. The same way that too much light in a picture can take away from what something should look like. And so we want the right amount of seasoning. We want the right amount of salt. We want the right amount of light. I don't know if you have noticed that when you go shopping, most men probably don't notice this. Most women may not notice it either, even though they do more shopping than us men. But when you go into the department stores, they are strategic in their lighting. You ever go into a jewelry store and see it as well? They want a bright white light that's going to make things pop. They want the jewelry to sparkle in such a way that it catches your eye. They want the clothing, the colors to be like, wow, that looks good. I would look good in this. Even though the, the lighting in the real world or the lighting in your home is completely different. But they're strategic to get the right amount of light. And so when we look at our text, Jesus gives us both the salt and the light for the cultural flavor where we live and what we do and he tells those that are his followers that you are to be the salt you are to be the light what is he saying you are to be the flavor of your culture you are to be the witness in your culture and so when we look at the basics of this and many of you are familiar with this but the two primary uses for salt salt in the ancient world would be to flavor food and also to preserve food and so if they wanted their food to taste good or taste the way they wanted it obviously they would put a right amount of salt on it and then there was the idea to put salt on the food help to preserve the food from decaying you know, sometimes when we, we go fishing and if there's, uh, as I'm soaking food, sometimes to help with the blood, I'll put a little salt in the water and we'll do this to help preserve our food. But then metaphorically speaking, there's something that Jesus was communicating to us, that God's people are to bring the right flavor to the world. They're to bring the right flavor to the culture that they are in. And ultimately, as we see this, you and I are called to be the agents of redemption or the agents of change. We are to make sure that things are, are, are going the way that it should be. We don't go with culture. We are supposed to shape or flavor the culture, if you're with me this morning, on that. The other thing that we see here is that we're supposed to prevent the decay and corruption by seasoning the culture. 
Isaiah prophesied and he said at a time when they would call evil good and they would call good evil. We're living in last days where these things are coming up that people are lovers of themselves, they're lovers of money, they are rebellious and, and we see just the landscape rapidly changing and the body of Christ is supposed to step up and be the salt to preserve and see that God's ways and God's teachings are still permeating or flavoring if you will this morning our culture. So Jesus is teaching that to be the salt of the earth, he wants us to flavor our culture. And then our text tells us that we are to be the light of the world. And I'm just laying a basis, a foundation for where we're about to, to go here this morning. But we know that what does light do? Light illuminates the darkness, right? When you turn a light on in a room, it illuminates a dark room and it exposes or it extinguishes the light. And we look at this in both a natural and a spiritual sense. In the morning, the sun rises and the darkness begins to fade. The same way that spiritually speaking, light speaks into spiritually dark places. The Bible says of Jesus that he was the light of the world. John talked about there was one coming as John was a forerunner. He said he was the light and the light would, or the darkness would never extinguish the light. And so we know that just a little light can light up a room. The same way, spiritually speaking, a little bit of spiritual light can bring light to spiritual darkness. And so we know that light also helps us to see where we're going. It exposes any obstacles in our way. When you're driving down the road at night, you don't want to turn off your headlights because then you can't see where you're going. You can't see if there's something in the road. And so spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, naturally speaking, we begin to get a picture of what Jesus is trying to tell us when he says you are the light of the world. And again, metaphorically we know that when the light begins to shine, it begins to reveal the bad. It begins to reveal the wrong. And I think of what the, the, the scriptures teach us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, meaning correction. It teaches us what's right and wrong. So the Word of God does this for us. The light comes into our life. It reveals, exposes the darkness. It illuminates the path for us to walk. Jesus said what about himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. This light reveals the path that men are to travel. And so when we begin to look at this, we begin to understand that we Christians should reveal the will of God for all of mankind. We are supposed to bring light into the dark areas of our societies and communities and neighborhoods. We are supposed to reveal the light or the way for people to come and find God. Your life is a testimony. Your life is a witness. Your words are powerful. And you are to speak these things to help people that don't yet know come to a place where they know the path they're supposed to travel. And so this kind of lays just the basics of salt and light. Now I want to begin to take it a little deeper. And as I look at the text, I begin to see something. That when I read about the salt and the light, it's really about our witness, as I've said. Our witness in the community. So as we are the flavor of our community, also we are to be a witness in our community. The salt and the light is teaching us how that we should live each day in the, the place that we inhabit. So when I think about this word witness, as I've looked at the, the scriptures, and the reason why I've, I've come to this place is because he talks about what, uh, can, when something is salty, can it be made salty again? You're the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill. You should, people, when you look and see a city on a hill, there's no mistaking there's a city up there. It's witnessing, testifying, there's something there. And so, salt and light is about a witness who bears witness. You're a witness, but you also bear witness to something else. And this is what I love about John chapter 1. Because in John chapter 1, John said, I'm not the light, I've just come to bear witness of the light. I've just come to testify or tell you about this light, the one that I'm not even worthy to, to unlace his sandals. I'm not worthy, but I'm telling you of this one who is worthy. I'm telling you of the one who has come from the Father. He is the Word made flesh. He came from God. He took on flesh and became one of us, and he lived among us, and he modeled, he witnessed for us what the salt and light is really all about. 
The deeper you go with this word witness, you begin to see that the Greek word for witness is the Greek word martyr. Some of you are familiar with that word, word martyr. Martyr is one who testifies to the truth. They also will give their life for this very truth. If you say you were a martyr of the faith, you were someone who not only testified to the truth, but you lost your life for the sake of that truth. There's no greater way for an individual to testify or bear witness to what they believe in than laying down their life for that very truth. You with me this morning on that? And so witnesses, they testify to the truth. How do they testify? With words and actions. They don't testify by being silent in a sense, but they testify with their words and actions. And so to be the salt and the light in this world is to testify to the world about what we believe. And so we say, what does that testimony look like? How are we witnessing to the world? When people look at Dusty's life, what do they see? When they listen to Dusty, what do they hear? Are they hearing about this salt and light? Are they hearing about the flavor that God would have me to put in our culture? What do they see? When someone looks at your life, what do they see? It's that time to, to just stop and slow down and, and be reflective this morning in your life. What do people see at your workplace? What does your family see in your home? What does others see out in the community? Do they see a testimony? Do they see this truth? Do they see that there's something different about you? Can they look at our lives and know that there's something different about us? So our words and our actions will speak to the culture that we live in. Now let me say this. I want to say it kind of slow so that you catch it. But being a witness is not about perfection, but about how we handle imperfection. Being a witness is not that I'm going to be perfect. I'm not going to be a perfect witness, but it's about how I handle even my imperfections as well as your imperfections because I'm going to testify to the difference maker in within me by how I respond when I'm not right. How do I respond? Am I quick to forgive? Am I quick to ask forgiveness? Am I quick to make allowance for your faults? Am I quick to do those kind of things? Am I reflective looking within? You with me this morning? So being a witness doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but it does mean that when you are imperfect, how does that person handle this? right? How do you handle the different and diverse people that are around us? So when we look at one another, are you difficult to get along with all of the time? Are you stubborn? Are you obstinate? Are you just a complainer, nothing but nagging all the time? Can people look at you and say that, man, I don't know that there's any love within them, right? Or do they see that, wow, there's something different about us? And so hear me this morning. I'm talking about being different this morning. How do I handle opposition? How do I handle those that seem to be antagonistic toward me? How do I handle those that try to push my buttons? How do I handle those that say things about me that aren't pleasing? How do I handle those that don't agree with me? How do I handle those that don't live like me? How do I handle the hard boss to work for? How do I handle those that don't believe politically like me? How do I handle those that don't have the same morals with me? How do I handle those that don't look like me? Are you with me this morning? Because that testifies. And catch what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. You may want to write this one down. The Bible says this, for though we live in the flesh, right? Though we, we, we live in this fleshly body, we do not fight battles that are carnal right? The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, right? So when we think we don't, though we walk in the flesh, we don't fight like other people do in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, the way that you and I are to fight, are not like the world fights, because we don't live like the world. We have a different kingdom, and Jesus witnessed to this. Have you ever thought about the significance of the moment that Jesus was betrayed by, by Judas. What did Peter do? Peter takes out a sword and he cuts off one of the guards' ears. And then he is ready to fight and defend the group. That would be the way that we fight according to the world. But what did Jesus say to Peter? Peter, put down your sword. 
There was a different way that he was going to fight this battle. He knew this was not a battle that was to be fought against flesh and blood, but there was a spiritual battle. There was something taking place behind the natural scene. And so God is calling you and I to understand and comprehend, as the Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. We fight against things that are not fleshly, even though the enemy may use those that are in the flesh. Are you with me this morning? But even still, you and I are called to fight and respond in a different way. I'm not going to lower my standards and become something that I'm not to try to get even or get over on someone. I'm not that. I'm not going to become that even if you do that to me. Because I want to be the salt and light in that situation. But Jesus gives us two warnings here. There's two warnings in our text about the salt and the light. One, if the saltiness loses its flavor, what good is it? No good. Be thrown out and trampled under feet. He gives us the warning about the light. A light is not to be hid under a basket, but a light is supposed to be out so that it can provide illumination for the things around us. So when we talk about this, I want to talk about losing your witness. I want to talk about losing your witness because our saltiness in our culture is about our witness. How are we flavoring the culture? But if you lose your witness, Jesus says it's no good anymore. You're no good anymore. You're forfeiting what the opportunity that you have. You know, we use this slang word we talk about being salty, right? The modern slang, you know, you're salty. And we think about there's a couple ways that we kind of use this. One is somebody's just angry, agitated, uh, or they're upset, like you're salty. But then there's the kind of salty that's annoying or mean or repulsive. You're like, that person's salty. You don't want to be around that person because they just irritate you because of their attitude. They're always salty about everything, and they're not the right amount of salt. Come on, you with me this morning. Somebody knows somebody that's been salty, right? They're, they're always angry. They're always upset. They're always agitated. Their attitude is repulsive. And it's like dumping a whole can of salt or a container of salt on your food. You don't want to be around that. It's not going to draw you back. And so when we think about this, we want to get away from them. You lose your witness if you're responding to situations, if you're responding to things in our culture in a too salty kind of way, a too bright kind of way. And so too salty is a turn off. But then there's being too bright. And I showed you the, the pictures of the overexposure, the underexposure. Now, I'm just going to say this is my opinion. I'm not going to say the Lord gave me this word because it may work and it may be more productive than I think. But a too bright situation for me is standing on the corner with the big sign yelling at people to repent, you're going to hell. Now, I'm not saying it may work for some, but for me, I think it's a little overboard. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying the Lord told me to tell you that. I'm just saying, in my opinion, I'm trying to give you an example of what it would be too bright. And, and you say, well, where do you even get that from? Well, when I look at how Jesus talked about repentance, when I looked about how Jesus responded and talked about hell, when I look at how John the Baptist was preaching, you'll remember that John the Baptist was baptizing, and he was baptizing people, and then the religious leaders come out to begin to question him. All of a sudden, his preaching changed, and he talks to them in a different way that he was talking to the others. And he talked, who warned you to flee God's judgment? He called them a brood of vipers, and he talked about them. And he says, repent and, and prove by the way that you're living that you've changed. He was dealing with a specific group of people knowing exactly how they were living. He just wasn't out yelling, repent, you're going to hell, that kind of a thing. When Jesus used the strong language, he always did it with the Pharisees and the religious leaders who were very re religious and very legalistic in, your, in their ways. But when he was with those who were willing to listen, at least superficially to start with, he gave grace. So he gave grace to the humble, but what did he do? He rejected the proud and we gave, he gave the law to the proud that way. So being too, too bright can also be a way of, of turning people off. But really specifically, our text is talking about hiding your light. And I want to talk about this in, in, in the light of being silent, being silent in our cultural. Coming into this room and, and getting all of this Jesus that we do, and then we're silent in our culture. 
We're silent in our community, silent in our neighborhoods, silent to the major issues of the day. I, I think about the, the political tensions, abortion, foster care, racial issues, sexuality, and the church, God's people are silent on these issues. We're afraid to bring them up for fear we might run somebody off or offend somebody, and we're not being the salt, we're not being the light into some of the most challenging issues of our day, knowing that we should be the seasoning of that. Instead, we're letting the, the news outlets, we're letting social media be in the salt and flavor. And all we see is more division, more tension. Churches are splitting. People are leaving churches because of the conversations that are being had. But we cannot be afraid to speak up and address these issues. But it must be done with the right amount of seasoning. We're not called as believers to antagonize each other. We've got to be careful how we address such matters because too much or too little it matters we are to be the preserving influence in our culture the apostle paul said it like this that we are to be ambassadors for christ right you are to speak on behalf of christ and we are to speak to the issues of our day now you may think well we're not supposed to speak against the powers that be we're not supposed to speak of that and i would say Study the life of John the Baptist. Understand why he got beheaded. Because he spoke to Herod. He spoke against the behavior. He spoke of the, 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 the sexual nature and inappropriate relationships that he was having. And for that very reason, he lost his head. He was speaking to be the salt and the light. He was an advocate. He was a messenger. He was an agent of redemption. He was an agent of change. He was the flavor in his culture. And ultimately, it was his witness that he became a martyr for Christ. You with me this morning? Let me shift here and talk about flavoring the culture. Flavoring the culture. If we're going to properly flavor the culture, I think we need to understand the culture God's way. When I study the New Testament especially, I begin to see two specific teachings where I notice Jesus addressing people. When Jesus is, is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he described it like a farmer who went out to plant good seed. And the farmer, he planted good seed, but then at nighttime an enemy came and he sowed all these weeds in his field. And the next day when his hired hands woke up, they freaked out. They saw what had happened. And they were like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So they're freaking out about this. Like, should we go up and pull all the weeds? And the farmer's like, no. Let them grow. When harvest comes, then we'll just separate the two. Symbolically speaking, what Jesus is trying to say, both unbeliever and believer are going to grow up and live together. There's going to come a time when I'm going to separate the unbeliever from the believer. And while you're in this life, you're going to live among unbelievers. You're going to live with people that don't think like you, live like you, believe like you. You're going to live with those that are going to constantly have an opportunity like the weed did to the good seed corrupt the seed. But Jesus said you're going to live with them. You're going to have to learn how to thrive in the midst of it. And I'll know my people when I come and I will separate the wheat from the tear. And then Jesus talks about that day there's going to be a final judgment. And he says all the nations, everyone, are going to be gathered together. So get that. He says all nations, that means every nation, tribe, and tongue, are going to be gathered before him. And when he calls them together, he calls them the sheep and the goat. And so he's going to separate the sheep, which were the believers, from the goat, which would be the unbelievers. And so when he gathers everybody together, there were two ways that he looked at us. Believer and unbeliever. So when we begin to look into our culture, we need to understand there's the believer and the unbeliever, right? Not just those are from the Eastern culture versus the Western culture. Not just those that are brown, white, black. No, not just male and female. That's why Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, when he was speaking, says there's, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither barbarian. He says there's all one in Christ Jesus. He looks at us as either believer or unbeliever. And so when we begin to look into God's culture, we need to understand that the main distinction between us is that we are either the believers 
are the unbelievers. And yet what I'm finding, though, is that the news outlets and social media is working tirelessly to divide us. They want us to see ourselves as Democrat or Republican, conservative or liberal, right? Black or white, rich or poor. And there's constantly something that's being shoved down my ears and throat to try to convince me that we're so divided. Stirring us up. This person's my enemy. That person's my enemy. Oh, he believes like that, so he's my enemy. Constantly stirring the pot. They want us to believe this, and we are becoming more and more divided by what I would say three things. Race, political affiliations, and our culture. And I just caution us this morning that these secular outlets are defining how we should, one, see each other, two, think about each other, and three, interact with each other. We're fighting each other instead of the real enemy. And what I'm finding is that our thinking is less and less like Jesus, because Jesus categorized us believer and unbeliever. The Bible tells me there's one Lord, there's one body, and one Savior. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we see like Jesus. And Jesus, as I told you a few messages ago, was a revolutionary. He refused to let the social and cultural norms of the day define how he would live and interact with others. We've got to do a better way, church, to find ways to unite and connect. We've got to be able to find a better way. We've got to do better to connect. We've got to put some effort into this. And I think there's a story in the scriptures where Jesus defies all of the social and cultural norms. He defies what all of the news outlets and the social media outlets of the day would have tried to convince him of. And he's doing some ministry and he's got to go to Galilee. But he decides, the Bible says, he had to go to Samaria. Some of you are going to know what I'm talking about. But the Bible says it like that. He had to go to Samaria. In John chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. When he got there, he begins to have a conversation with the Samaritan woman. And the conversation goes like this. The woman was surprised. Why? Because it wasn't culturally accepted for a Jew and a Samaritan to hang out and have conversations. It wasn't what the news outlets were promoting. It wasn't what social media was teaching them to do. And so be, the fact that Jesus would come into Samaria, the fact that he would defy the cultural norms, and first of all, have a conversation with a woman, a man talking to a woman, you didn't do that either. Either. Now he's talking to a Samaritan because the Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. There was this idea that the Jews were better than the Samaritans. They called them half-breeds dating all the way back to the Babylonian captivity and their exodus from there whenever they were going to rebuild the Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall and do all of this. They weren't allowed to participate. And here Jesus is. He's got to go to this place, he says. I just got to do it. And here he comes to Samaria and he has a conversation and the woman is surprised. Why? For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you a Jew and I a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Why do you want to have a conversation with me? See, the news outlets want us to think that a Republican or a Democrat can't even go out to eat and have the same conversation, let alone come in here and worship. You can't go hang out with somebody. If you're white, you can't hang out with somebody that's black. If you're black, you shouldn't hang out with somebody that's white because you're supposed to be divided. You're supposed to be against each other because we're all racist. Now, that doesn't mean that we're, people aren't racist. It doesn't mean that some aren't. It doesn't mean that some Democrats and Republicans can't get together. Come on, you with me? This I'm, not, I'm not denying problems. I'm just saying the world wants me to believe I can't interact and unite with somebody that may look different than me, may believe different than me, think different than me, right? And that's exactly what happened, what Jesus was dealing with when he went to Samaria. But he, divides, he defies all of the cultural norms of the day. 
And so you and I need to be doing the same thing. We need to find ways. We should be telling ourselves, i got to go do this. I need to go find a way to start a conversation with somebody that don't think like me. I've got to go find a way because it's not black and white, right? There's not Republican and Democrat. You may think those things, but one day when you stand before God, he's not going to be, well, were you a Republican? Were you a conservative? Were you a liberal? <laughs> what color is this? He, every tribe, nation, and tongue is going to stand before him, and he's going to say, were you a believer or not? So we got a responsibility to get out there and make more believers. Not just come in here and listen and be good, you know, and I can only talk like to those people that, you know, think like me. Come on. Come on, we're, we're getting where we're going this morning. But the closer we get to Jesus, the more we begin to think like Jesus. And Jesus brought more than a gift to this woman. He brought more than the gift of life because we know how the text goes. He says, I've got water that'll make you never thirst again. And she's like, well, give me some of that water. But something even happens there in the text that's even amazing. Because as the conversation develops, he begins to point out stuff that's going on in her lifestyle. Because you know the religious leaders and the religious people today surely didn't hang out with somebody that had all kinds of husbands. You know, the religious leaders were all up on Jesus' back all the time. He knew that woman. If he knew what kind of lifestyle she lived, oh, he's hanging out with the tax collectors. Oh, he's hanging out with all the bad people. Can you believe it? Oh, there goes his witness. Oh, he's supposed to be some religious holy guy. Look who he hangs out with, the scumbags. He hangs out with all the people that nobody should be hanging out with. Jesus was constantly savoring, putting flavor to the culture, constantly defying the cultural norms of the day. And that's what he was doing there. He was the salt and the light in that situation, demonstrating how we should live together with others, how we should think of others. He didn't judge the woman based on the fact that she had all those husbands and the one she was living with now wasn't her husband. Right? I mean, if he did, he could have said, all of this bad stuff to her. It could have put her in her place. I could think of some choice words that he might have used for someone like that. I mean, he could have done that, but is that what he did? No, because she needed something that he had, right? When your meat doesn't have any flavor and you got the salt, you need the person with the salt. What do you say? Pass me the salt. Don't be hoarding the salt. I need a little on my food, right? You have the salt. You have the light. Somebody that's in darkness needs what you have. And we've got to go to Samaria. We've got to get out there and be the flavor in our culture. Jesus is teaching us not to take our cues from the media's playbook, but from God's book. Come on, let me say it again. He's teaching the church today. Stop taking your cues from the media. Stop taking it from somebody's comment thread or post on Facebook. Get into God's book and let God lead you by the power of the Holy Spirit. The light of the world came to show us the way. But you know, as we do this, we need to find the right flavor. Because when you get the right flavor, the right flavor brings you back. Come on. When you get the right flavor, Chantal and I found a New Mexican restaurant. And it has the right flavor for both of us. Not just something that she likes, but it's got the right flavor for both, both of us. Now, I, I don't venture out and get a lot of different things. I'm a quesadilla person everywhere I go. But I'll judge you, not you, but I'll judge the restaurant based on the quesadilla and the queso. And so if the flavor of the queso is good, if the flavor of the quesadilla, the meat, the seasoning, then, then you got me. I'm coming back, right? I'm actually thinking about the next opportunity that I can come back. Because when you get the right flavor, I want to come back. Right? I know that when Randy Spillers and the team were working to develop that seasoning for their fish and all of that, they had to work to get the right flavor. There was a lot of this and a lot of that, a lot of testing, a lot of back and forth trying to figure out so they could get just the right flavor so that after you had the first bite, you're like, I want another bite. I want another bite. You know what? We need to get him to come and do our event because that tastes good. Are you with me this morning? When you get the right flavor, it's not repulsive. It's, it's, it's not too much light. It's not too little light, but it's the right amount of light. It's not too much salt. It's not too little salt. It's the right amount of salt. And we've got to be the right amount of salt, the right amount of light this morning because we want great flavor. We don't want to be too salty. We don't want to be too right. And you know the other thing that I've learned, and I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a cooker, baker. I don't do all that stuff. I can make peanut butter fudge and a grilled cheese pretty good. I can grill a hot dog too sometimes if I'm paying attention. 
burn them. But, but here's what I learned as I read and was studying for this. Timing. Timing is important for seasoning. You know, when you put what you put on what you're going to put it on is important, right? Some foods you need to marinate. Some things need to soak, right? Some stuff you've got to keep putting on as it goes, right? If you're, uh, you're, you're smoking something, you know, you're going to continue to, to baste it or whatever you do when you do those kind of things. But you, you, you got to have the right timing for it, right? Because the timing helps make it more savory. And I say to the church, God's church, not just this church, but timing is important. Right now, I believe that the church has a God-given opportunity to be in our culture, to be in our community, to be the salt and the light, to be something different. Not that pushes people away, something that's going to draw people back. We have the opportunity. Pastors have been afraid to address these cultural issues. And so I'm saying to us, we need to think about how we do what we do when we do it because it matters. It matters. And God is calling us to get out there in the community. And I'm going to throw in a word, a little term that I think could shed some light on some of this. And one of the reasons why I think that many have been turned away from the church is because of a term called echo chamber. And some of you have heard that term. You, you know what I'm talking about when you think about an echo chamber. But it's where sound just reverberates back and forth with inside there. It's a closed system. You could also define it in the way you say an environment in which a person encounters only beliefs or opinions that coincide with their own and views are reinforced that way. And we don't factor anything else in. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about letting the culture come in and redefine our theology. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about this morning is simply this. I'm using the term in the sense that we need to let uh, our theology begin to be the salt and the light outside. That these rooms become an echo chamber. What we preach, teach, sing, all of that just happens right in here. And it has no effect in the community at large. And so I'm seeing that we're, we're using this term in the sense that the churches are closing off from their communities we're establishing. We're refusing to talk about things. We're becoming irrelevant to issues in our communities because we're being silent. We're supposed to be the light, but we've hid it inside a room. Well, we're supposed to be the salt, but we've not passed it. Come on, we're keeping all the salt for our, ourselves this morning. And so we're covering this light for the city by closing our doors and doing what we do within the four walls of a building instead of being agents of redemption, agents of change. Our text tells us this. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus says, let the world see your good deeds. Let the world see these things. Now, we're not talking about the passage where he was dealing with the heart, where he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's saying the world needs to see. The world needs to experience what happens when you come in here in this room. Because what happens in this room should affect the city that we live in. The good things of God should not be confined to a room on a Sunday morning. We're not here simply to come to this place and do good. We're to do the good in the community that we live in. Many of you have experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. When the day of Pentecost fell, we saw the power of God demonstrated, and many were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they spoke with other tongues. But Jesus told us that when this happened, that it would be a demonstration of the power of God that we would be able to witness in that very power. It wasn't to be just confined to an experience at an altar. But the reason why that he was going to baptize us was to send us out and be a witness. To send you out and to be the salt and the light into your community. It wasn't to be confined to a religious experience. But God was going to do something in us that allowed me to be what the community needed me to be. We could face the opposition and the challenges of our day because we would be empowered with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying to us that God is calling his church to rise up and go like Jesus did. That he's calling us to go out and do these things. We need God to move in here. Yes, hear me. We need God to move in here for more than personal reasons. 
I need God to do something more than just for me. We need God to do more. Because if we're going to be the salt and the light, I need it to be more than just what he's doing in my heart. We need God to move in here so that he can move us out there to reach more that haven't had what we have. So when we take what God is doing in here out there, we will see the need. You'll begin to see, like Jesus, when he was out walking among them, he said he was moved with compassion because he said he saw they were sheep without a shepherd. He saw a need because he was out there. A lot of times we don't see all the need in this room, but when we get out there, we begin to see the real need. When we begin to shut off the television, turn off Facebook and Instagram, and get out there in the community, you see there's a real need. There are real people out there. And I was having lunch this week with a friend, and as we were talking about some of the things in this message, we were talking about some of the things that God has called him to do. And I thought, man, that would be a perfect illustration of someone who saw a need and decided, I need to be the salt and the light into this situation. So I'm going to invite Steve Lindsley to come and, and share uh, just a few minutes about how God moved him, how he saw a need, not because he was watching a news channel or not because he, he was reading a Facebook post. I'm going to ask you to come up here, Steve. You've got to get up here in front of everybody. <laughs> But I want him to tell you about what God has called him to do. And just listen, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not a public speaker. But uh, I deployed a few times. Uh, I was not in Vietnam, Tom. I was not in World War II. And, but uh, I, I did deploy to Iraq and uh, saw some things that... Uh, you sh nobody should see uh, the casualties, the uh, the injuries, the wartime things are things that we're not supposed to have to experience, but it, they're real. Um, when I got back, uh, uh, some people in our unit did not tolerate it very well, didn't didn't cope with it very well, and I had I had issues too. In fact, I had a wonderful wife and uh, good family, and I had a faith that uh, helped me through that, but. Uh, took counseling and it took a uh, spiritual, where am I at here? Uh, took a uh, uh, spiritual mentorship from uh, pastors along the way that could help me. But there are so many that didn't get that. So uh, anyway, uh, y'all see them. You go by uh, the, driving down the road, you'll see somebody that says, they'll just, they have a sign, veteran, hungry, you know, please help. You'll see, uh, uh, veterans sleeping on uh, park benches um, in a tent in the bushes on the side of the road. Those, they're, they're people that need help and uh, sometimes their problems are problems that they brought on themselves. There's self-medicating, uh, just, just unable to cope with life after what they saw, what they experienced. So uh, anyway, we just, we wanted to try to help. I, I found some folks who felt the same way and uh, we bought uh, seven and a half acres over in Arcadia, and uh, we're putting in a tiny house community. The uh, community is not just for housing. The community is going to have a small community center and a bunch of tiny houses, but the goal is to promote a sense of community for those who've lost their way, to give them an opportunity to find it again with help counseling, whatever, whatever type of help is needed, whether it be simply, hey, we, we need to help you to get off these substances, or, well, maybe they need to figure out how to balance a budget. Maybe they need to figure out how to reconcile with the people that they've alienated because they came back angry. That's what I did, honey. I was angry when I got back and couldn't understand the petty things that were going on around me when people were getting killed over there. So... I don't know what each person's issue is, but that's something I relate to, and it's something that I would like, I'm, well, we're going to make a difference in. And uh, so anyway, just I just want to let you know that's going on, and uh, you'll see people in need everywhere, but if this is a need that uh, relates to you and that you think, hey, you know, it's something I'd like to come alongside, then uh, let us know. It's called Project for Hope, and uh, we have a a website that's being reconstructed, but there is a Facebook page right now that you can go, go in and, and look at. Thank you.
I'm going to invite our worship team to come. You know what I thought was so, so powerful about, you know, what I've seen Steve and family doing and others that have come alongside is that they were close enough to the need to feel the pain and see, see what was happening. And you know what? They said, we are willing to take a step of faith and do something about it. Instead of waiting for somebody else to come along and see what they would do or say the government's responsibility, all those kind of things, right? He and his family understand they are the salt and the light. They wanted to go into the situation. I mean, there's been extreme obstacles and battles that they've had to, to try to overcome for this. It's never without a fight. It's never without the need for grit. But we can do these kind of things. And there will be many lives that will be affected this way. And so I'm going to close us this way. We want to gather around the communion table. We're just about finished. And the, the ushers are going to come, and they're going to deliver communion. And you guys can go ahead and, and distribute those. And I want to bring us back to the most important thing, the life and death of Jesus. And I want you just to begin to, to close your eyes here this morning and just take a moment, relax. Let God begin to speak to your heart. There's some areas in your life that you just need to let God deal with this morning. What are some areas even that you could go and be that salt and light? And as the ushers come around and they distribute the communion, just take the communion, hold it, and then I'll lead us all together as we, we uh, will partake here in just a second. But just take the communion. Communion is open to everyone. This is what Jesus has done for us. So just take the elements and hold the elements, and then we'll all participate together. Thank you for watching today's message. I hope it blessed and encouraged you. Click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And let me encourage you, consider giving to support the ministries of Gateway Church. You can do that by texting 77977 and then put GW Shreve in the text box. Also, download our app in the App Store, Gateway Church Shreveport. Share this with your friends and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.